Companies like Pfizer and Bayer as pharmaceutical empires that make critical medications, and also as corporations that are at the center of the opioid crisis. A new book by journalist Gerald Posner, he explains why that dichotomy fits so well in the industry's history. Pharma, greed, lies, and the poisoning of America details how the industry went from heroin and cocaine peddlers to the mega conglomerates that we know today. And Gerald Posner joins us now via Skype. Congrats on the book. Great to have you, sir. Good to see you, Gerald. Uh, very much. Great to be with both of you. Mm -hmm. Just lay on a little bit of that history in particular of the pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, uh, Crystal, I mean, I was amazed. You know, I spent the last five years on reporting on this book, and I didn't know it until I got into it. But essentially, before the 1906 Pure Food and Drugs Act was passed, it was the Wild West, meaning that no prescriptions were required for any drug that you wanted. Uh, heroin was legal. It was actually trademarked by Bayer, which invented it in 1900, or after the German word Hiroche. Uh, barbiturates were legal, also invented by Bayer in 1903. Phenobarbital was their big product. Uh, cocaine was used in products, alcohol, cannabis, and all of these potions marketed. For, uh, you could walk into any store. Sears and Roebuck, the biggest catalog in the country for $1.50, sold your hypodermic needle and a small amount of cocaine. And that all ended. The party was over in 1914 when the Harrison Act was passed, banned all the narcotics, and then we did our experiment with prohibition. And the pharmaceutical companies had to figure out a way to reinvent themselves, which really happens in World War II with penicillin. Mm -hmm. And you know, Gerald, mm -hmm. of course, we're speaking in, virtually in the middle of a pandemic. These are now the people who are in charge of developing therapeutics, of developing the vaccines. What can we, I mean, can we trust at all that, that our best interests will be covered here? How are the, the regulations at play? I mean, what should we be looking for as we try to make our way out of this thing? Well, you know, Sagar, that's what I think is so interesting. The history, you know, Prelude tells you what's coming, and it does in this case, absolutely. And that is, they will look out for our best interests in terms of coming up with cures in terms of a vaccine and treatments, but at a price. And that is, it's a for-profit business. I get that. They're entitled to a profit. But in the past, when they've had the opportunity in a public health crisis, they've used that leverage to really take advantage of it. So for your viewers who might remember in 1976 when Gerald Ford was president, uh, this swine flu epidemic, they, the country had actually authorized Congress $135 million authorization to inoculate the country. They only inoculated about $40 million eventually because it turned out there was no swine flu pandemic. But the four pharmaceutical companies, including Merck, Wyeth, and others, that made 100 million doses, when the government went to them and said, okay, we're ready, give us the doses, they said, oh, not so fast. We want two things. We want congressional authorization in the statute that we will earn a reasonable profit. That was their quote. And then secondly, that we have no responsibility, no liability for any after effects. Government said yes. It was government lawyers of the DOJ who ended up defending 4,000 lawsuits for Guillain-Barre, a neurological syndrome afterwards. The drug companies walked off with hundreds of millions of dollars in profits. So their past has not been so great at these times of health crises. Yeah, Absolutely. and they received massive protections in certain terms of things like patent protections. And the justification that we're always given is that they need those because they invest so much money into research and development of potentially life-saving drugs. Um, we've found, and we've talked here about how a lot of that is a misnomer. A lot of the research is actually funded by the federal government, and they just bring it to market. They tend to spend their R&D dollars on things like, you know, developing new iteration of Viagra or one of the major profit centers. Just dig into that piece a little bit for us. Yeah, you know, Crystal, that's absolutely key because I have a chapter in there called The One Atom Difference. It was the instance in the 1950s in which Pfizer was able to get a new antibiotic approved that was one atom of difference from a competitor's antibiotic. No therapeutic difference at all. They went to court and they were essentially able to get it. It went to the Supreme Court. That opened up the floodgates for what I call these Me Too variations. And what you said a moment ago about public research. $900 billion has been spent since the late 1930s by American taxpayers on the NIH, the National Institutes of Health for Public Research. That research has then been taken by drug companies who put it into a drug and get a patent on it and get 17 to 20 years of protection. When HIV and AIDS had the first drug developed, AZT, in the 1980s, it was a researcher at the NIH who said to Burroughs, by the way, we think you have an antiviral over there that might be useful for us. Uh, could you provide it to us for testing? Burroughs wasn't using the drug. They had a patent on it. It was too toxic. They'd never developed it. They couldn't even make the drug in the lab. The NIH had to help them make the compound. They mm. then sent it to mm. the NIH, which spent $100 million researching the drug and gave it back to them in a year. That drug, AZT, was the first drug approved. Burroughs got a patent on it. 
charged $10,000 a patient, which at that time was a record, against protests from ACT UP and other age group, it lowered the price to 8,000. It made billions of dollars off that public research. And that's happened also time and again. One last thing, $8.3 billion, you both know this very well, the first emergency funding bill that came out of Congress just a few weeks ago. That included a provision initially that would have given the government the real power to get in there and negotiate prices down on the vaccine if they thought they were unreasonable, and also take away the intellectual property rights for the drug companies. The research would be shared. By the time the bill passed, both Democrats and Republicans, both sides of the aisle, had agreed to strip those out. Pharma lobbies both sides effectively, and both sides are blamed for this. Yeah, well, there you go. That's, That's the disgusting. story of our entire American healthcare system, and pharma in particular, isn't it, Gerald? So let's talk about that in particular. Let's talk about this coronavirus, not just with the vaccine, not just with therapeutics. Will this have any effect on the system, in your view? Are there any? Is there anybody calling it out? Is there any mass political awareness that this is happening? It's frustrating that there isn't more of a mass political awareness that this is happening. And, you know, I have a, the, the penultimate chapter in the book is called The Coming Pandemic. A research scientist says at the end of that book, the closing line is uh, the coming pandemic is not a question of if, it's a question of when. And the doctors and scientists who have been looking at viruses and bacterial pathogens knew that it was only a matter of time. They weren't predicting this year, but at some point this year, 10 years, 15 years down the road, we. Pharma waits for this opportunity. This is a cold calculus when I say this, uh, but this is an opportunity for them, almost a once in a lifetime opportunity because it, people will not end up paying for the vaccine. No German, nobody in the UK, no American, nobody in South America or in Italy is actually gonna pay for it. It's gonna be paid for the governments. Governments will pay for it then roll it out. And the question is, why aren't we keeping an eye on it now? So for instance, Gilead, very good company, takes remdesivir, which is one of the products that may be useful as a treatment, and they try to put it under, I have a chapter on orphan drugs. Most of your viewers will say, what orphan drugs? It's a little known section of the law that allows genetic diseases, you get special tax benefits and credits, you get an extended patent. They put it under that, even though it was really gaming the system. Five days of protest, they withdrew that. It wasn't from politicians. Nobody on the Hill was saying that. It w wasn't Nancy Pelosi, or it wasn't Chuck Schumer. It, you weren't hearing it from McConnell. No one was coming out and saying, by the way, that's the wrong thing. It was just sort of a grassroots opposition from people who monitor the industry. I wish Washington would put more of a magnifying glass on pharma, but they just don't. Yeah, well, and as you said, I mean, the, the power of organized money in this town, I mean, they, they run everything. We've seen that not just with regards to health care, but in this entire response. Um, of course, we've also covered here extensively the opioid crisis and the role of certain pharmaceutical um, companies in terms of pushing opioids on the public, hiding what they had to have known was a massive addiction crisis and all of that. Is there a way, though, to crack down on pharmaceutical companies as long as sort of profit is at the center and as long as we have money in politics running the show as it is now? Yeah, I think there is. I do, and one just half a step back, Crystal, when you say about the opioid crisis, uh, a lot of journalists don't use freedom of information a lot because they say, oh, it's slow, it takes forever. I guess what's good is since I take five years to do a book project, I can sort of apply in the beginning and wait for it to come out. And from freedom of information files, I got things on the Sackler family. We think of them just as the family with Purdue Pharma. But what I call the Sacklers in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, a Senate investigation said there's a Sackler empire with all these companies tied together. And the date of that memo is 1962. Um, mm. They were card carrying members of the American Communist Party. The FBI investigated them for 20 years. So there's a great backstory to that that comes out of government files. The question of what we can do, let me tell you, there's some very simple fixes in here that people just don't seem to have on their radar. Uh, and one of the easiest is, for instance, if we require transparency in the drug distribution network, I have a chapter on something called pharmacy benefit managers. They sort of operate, they make the formularies that many people have when they go to get a drug and you have to see if it's covered by your insurance policy. They've got great power. They're among the top 50 biggest companies in America, Caremark, PDS, and others. What happens is they don't have to say, disclose to the public or to anybody else whether they get a rebate from the drug company for putting the drug on the formulary. So you're not necessarily getting the best drug for treatment or the cheapest drug. You're getting the drug for which they have the largest rebate. It's estimated that Medicaid spends about three to four billion dollars a year on these rebates alone. They should be public. And if they were public, I guarantee you they would dry up overnight. We just need to shine a light on them. It's not a big fix. It could be an executive order.
Hmm. Wow. Oh. Well, the book is remarkable. Yeah. We encourage people to check it out. It's Please, everybody, go order it. Pharma, Greed, Lies, and the Poisoning of America. Gerald, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for your in-depth work, th work on this. It's so important. Thanks, Gerald. Thank you. Thanks. Keep up the great work on uh, your end as well, keeping both sides of the aisle honest. Thank Trying you. Do so. Doing our best it's over a very here. Difficult job.